If you want to increase your influence, if you want to put your influence to work, you must develop an avid capacity for learning. You must develop a voracious appetite for knowledge, for information. Hosea chapter 4 verse 6, my people are destroyed for lack of not for lack of money, not for lack of prayer, not for lack of the anointing, uh, for lack of knowledge. Welcome to Maximize Live, the television broadcast from New Wine Church London. Jesus said, I have come that you may have life and have it more abundantly. Our mandate is to challenge you to be all you can be. So get ready to be encouraged, enriched and empowered. You will never be the same again. Now here is your host, Pastor Michael Olaware. Thank you so much for joining us on the broadcast today. This is Maximize Life, where we encourage you to be all that you can be. I am Michael Olaware, your host and the senior pastor of New Wine Church in Woolwich, London. Today we are looking at another life-transforming message by Dr. Tayo Adeyemi, the founding pastor of New Wine Church, London. Am I spiritual father? who has gone home to be with the Lord. Today's message is titled, Five Instruments of Influence. I'm sure it will encourage you. It will enrich you. And without fail, it will empower you. Stay tuned. Make it your goal to know more about at least one subject than everybody else in the organization you work for. Okay, you didn't hear that, so I'm going to say it again. Make it your goal to know more about at least one subject than anyone else in the organization you work for. If you, can, if you can do this one thing I'm telling you, very quickly, your influence will grow and your influence will spread. Your influence will do what? Say grow. grow. Say spread. spread. Very, very quickly in that organization. In fact, you might become indispensable. I read about a guy who had the foresight and he saw that very quickly the next level for the company he worked for will be Europe, will be extending into Europe. So he decided to go and learn French. He knew as much French as you and I know. He learned French in school like every one of us. He could say bonjour, he could say je suis, he could say oui, oui, bon, bon. <laughs> but he undertook to start to learn French. And so he listened to French music. He read French novels. And every year when he went on holiday, guess where he went? France. And when it came for his company, when the time came for his company to open a branch in France, guess who they picked to go head that branch? Now, he was not the most qualified professionally to head the branch. But because he had the leading edge of understanding French and French culture, he was handpicked over and above those who are more qualified and more skillful than himself. Another guy made it his goal to know and understand the local nightlife better than all his colleagues. So he knew about all the nightclubs, the restaurants, the bars, the theaters in the area where his company was based. Now when that company began to bring clients in from out of town, Guess who they called upon to show them where to eat and where to entertain the guests. And so now he's going out with the bosses to restaurants, to clubs, to theaters. He begins to wine and dine with the bosses. Before long, he became one of them. <laughs> now, these are rather mundane examples, but I'm sure you get the picture. Listen closely. Whenever someone comes to you and asks you a question, never end the question with, I don't know. Never end it with I don't know. Because when you end it with I don't know, what you're really saying is I don't know and I don't care. Tell them I don't know but I can find out from you for you. Or I don't know but you can ask so and so. Give them something to help them. Never become a dead end. In the early days of New Wine, the people who work with me, our staff and, and my leaders understood that I didn't know how to take no for an answer. Don't ever come back to me and say, Pastor, I couldn't do it. Tell me I couldn't do it, but I've got three suggestions. Which one do you think I should follow? Then, then I know you're thinking. I couldn't do it means you've become helpless and you've reached the end of the road and you are not equipped to reach the end of the road like that. Are you hearing me today? So let's go back to those two concepts. Say acquire and share. Say locate and communicate. 
Say collect and distribute. Before you can share information, you must first acquire it. You cannot give what you don't have. That makes sense. And before you can acquire information, you must have a desire to learn. You must have a desire to learn. I want you to listen closely to me. If you want to increase your influence, if you want to put your influence to work, you must develop an avid capacity for learning. You must develop a voracious appetite for knowledge, for information. Hosea chapter 4 verse 6, my people are destroyed for lack of not for lack of money, not for lack of prayer, not for lack of the anointing, uh, for lack of knowledge. Amen. Not for lack of opportunity. But when you read that scripture, you will begin to think, lack of knowledge means there's a shortage of knowledge. No, 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 no. When the Bible says my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge, they didn't lack it because there was a shortage. They lacked it because they had no desire for it. Look at the rest of that verse. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge because you have rejected knowledge. I will also reject you. That's what God said. So it wasn't that the knowledge was not available. They just were not interested. Listen, God has created us as human beings with an incredible capacity for learning. Scientists tell us that we hardly use 10% of the capacity of our brain. Do you know that when most animals are born, their brain is about 98% developed? When human beings are born, our brain is only 38% developed. So we have an incredible capacity to develop our brain and to grow. Sadly, most people, from that time that they're born, their brain has moved from 38% to 42 <laughs> Tell your neighbor, not me. But this is the point, if you refuse to learn and grow, you have denied yourself a fundamental human right. Be voracious in your appetite for learning. Because you see, when you think you know it all, it's what you learn after you know it all that really counts. You can finish school, but you cannot finish learning. You can finish education, but you cannot finish learning. Learning is a lifelong endeavor. It's a lifelong enterprise. When you are through learning, you are through. The day you stop learning is the day you start dying. So develop a teachable spirit. Adopt the posture of a student. Adopt the posture of a learner. And don't be, don't be, uh, don't be picky. Don't be choosy about who you learn from. Because information can come to you in any package. It can come to you from people who are younger than you. As a matter of fact, as a matter of fact, you can learn much more from your children than you. Oh, oh. The point is this: there is no, there is no excuse for ignorance. We live in an age of information explosion. How many of you remember the days that if you needed to know something, you had to travel to the library, and then you had to go to the encyclopedia section? And pull out a big encyclopedia. Maybe pull out two or three volumes of encyclopedia. Some of you don't even know what I'm talking about. <laughs> Encyclo who? <laughs> Nowadays, all the information you need is at, available at the click of a mouse. It's there. Just Google it. That's my mantra. Nike says just do it. I say just Google it. <laughs> or check Wikipedia. I bet there's information about your village on Wikipedia. Your, not your country, your village. If you don't believe me, go home and check. In 1999, in the U.S. alone, more than 155,000 books were produced in one year. That's more than 400 books a day. In 1998, in the U.S. alone, 900 new magazines were launched. Listen, friend, there is no excuse for ignorance. Did you know that if you set aside 15 minutes a day to read a book, you will read an average of 24 books a year? 15 minutes a day. 24 books a year. If you live for the next 42 years, you would have read more than 1,000 books. That's more than five times what you read to get your degree. If you're alive for the next 42 years, 15 minutes a day, 
you will read a thousand books. Now, double that to 30 minutes a day or make it one hour a day. It's just amazing. It's just amazing. It's just amazing. Are you hearing me? So you must acquire information. And please understand, part of acquiring information is knowing the word of God. If you want to influence people for God, you need to know the God of the influence. And if you need to know God, you need to know his word. So develop a hunger for the word of God. Job said, I have desired his word more than my necessary food. Uh, the psalmist said, I know more than the ancients because your precepts are my meditation. Jesus said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. The people who have a hunger for the word of God are the people who are on the cutting edge of influencing people for God. If you have a hunger for the word, your light will be bright, your salt will be sharp. But you see, after you acquire information, you must be willing to share it. Be willing to pass on what you know to others. Because you see, the more knowledge is shared, the more valuable it becomes. There are some things when you share it with someone, you are left with half. But with knowledge, when you share it, you double it. Be generous with information. If you know something that will help another person get ahead in life, share it with them. Don't hoard information. Don't hold on to knowledge just for the sake of it. Keeping what you know from others does not put you at an advantage over them because you know why? They will eventually get the information and you would have missed the opportunity to increase your relevance and your influence with them. We say knowledge is power, but really knowledge is power only when it is shared. So tell somebody, acquire and share. Now in selecting what information to share, Make sure that it is three things, that it satisfies three criteria. Number one, it is relevant. Number two, it is useful. And number three, it is exciting. So don't bring information to your board meeting that has no bearing on where your company is going. Say relevant. relevant. Say useful. useful. Say exciting. Now, in closing today, I would like to share with you a speech that was delivered by a gentleman called Hafiz A.B. Mohammed. He delivered this speech sometime end of 2008 or early 2009. Dr. Hafiz A.B. Mohammed is the director general of Al Baraka Bank, the largest Islamic banking group in the world. I bumped into this information when I was in Tanzania in October. One of the speakers at the camp meeting I went to is a Minister by the name Dr. Charles Ajina Sari from Ghana. Some of you have heard of him. And he shared this information with us, so I'm passing it on to you. This is a speech that Afiz Mohammed gave to a group of Muslims end of 2008 or early 2009. He started by sharing demographics with them. He said, friends, the world population of Jews is 14 million. Seven million of them are in America, five million in Asia, two million in Europe, a hundred thousand in Africa. Fourteen million. He said the world population of Muslims is 1.5 billion. One billion in Asia and the Middle East, 400 million in Africa, 44 million in Europe, six million in the Americas. He said every fifth human being on the planet Earth is a Muslim, one out of every five. He said, every sing, for every single Hindu, there are two Muslims. For every Buddhist, there are two Muslims. For every Jew, there are 107 Muslims. He said, yet 14 million Jews are more powerful than 1.5 billion Muslims. This is a Muslim talking to his fellow Muslims. And he asked the question, why? He said, here are some of the reasons. And he began to list the accomplishment of Jews in the world. He started by talking about the movers of current history, Albert Einstein, Sigmund Freud, Karl Marx, Paul Samuelson, Milton Friedman, they were all Jews. He talked about those who had achieved medical milestones, the vaccination needle, Benjamin Rubin, polio vaccine, Jonas Salk, leukemia drug, Gertrude Elion, 
Hepatitis B was discovered by Baruch Bloomberg, uh, syphilis, Paul Ehrlich, neuromuscular medicine, Eli Metinkoff, endocrinology, Andoscali, cognitive therapy, Aaron Beck, the contraceptive, Gregory Pincos, understanding the human eye, G. Ward, embryology, Stanley Cohen, kidney dialysis, William Clothcam. He said, let's talk about Nobel Prize winners. He said, in the past 105 years, 15 million Jews have won 180 Nobel Prizes. And 1.5 billion Muslims have only brought back home three Nobel Prizes. He talked about inventions that change history. The microprocessing chip by Stanley Mezzo, nuclear chain reactor by Leo Zeeland, uh, the fiber optic cable by Peter Schultz, traffic lights by uh, Charles Adler, stainless steel by Benno Strauss, sound movies by Isa Dokisi, the telephone microphone by Emil, Emil Bellin, Bellina, uh, the videotape recorder by Charles Ginsburg. He talked about people who were influential in global business. Polo Ralph Lauren is a Jew. Founder of Coca-Cola is a Jew. Levi Jeans, Levi Strauss, a Jew. Starbucks CEO, Howard Schultz, Google, Sergey Brin, Dell Computers, Michael Dell, Oracle, Larry Ellison, DKNY, Donna Karen, uh, Baskin and Robbins, Ev Robbins, Dunkin' Donuts, Bill Rosenberg, all Jews. What about influential politicians and intellectuals? Henry Kissinger, U.S. Secretary of State, Richard Levin, President of Yale University, Aaron, Alan Greenspan, U.S. Federal Reserve uh, President, uh, Joseph Lieberman, Madeleine Albright, Secretary of State, Caspar Winbiger, Secretary of Defense, Maxim Litinov, USSR Foreign Minister, David Marshall, Singapore Chief Minister, Isaac Isaacs, Governor General of Australia, Benjamin Disraeli, our Prime Minister here in Britain, Yevgeny Primakov, Russian Prime Minister, Barry Goldwater, Jorge Sampaio, Herb Gray, and so on and so forth, all of them Jews. He said in the world of global media, CNN's Wolf Blitzer, ABC News' Barbara Walters, Washington Post Eugene Meyer, Time Magazine's Henry Gronwald, Washington Post Catherine Graham, New York Times Joseph Layeld and Mark Frankel, all Jews. Talked about global philanthropies. George Soros is a Jew. Walter Annenberg, Jew. He now asks his people, why are they powerful and why are Muslims powerless? He said, we have lost the capacity to produce knowledge. He said, in the entire Muslim world of 55 Muslim countries, there are only 500 universities. In the USA alone, there are 5,758 universities. In India alone, there are over 8,400 universities. He said, there is not one university in the entire Islamic world that features in the top ranking 500 universities in the world. He said the literacy level in the Christian world is 90%. The literacy level in the Muslim world is 40%. He said there are 15 Christian majority countries that have a literacy rate of 100%. There is not a single Muslim majority country that has achieved 100% literacy rate. He said 98% in Christian countries completed primary school. In Muslim countries, only 50% completed primary school. He said in Christian countries, 40% attended university. In Muslim countries, 2%. He said in Muslim majority countries, they have 230 scientists for every 1 million Muslims. He said in the USA alone, they have 5,000 scientists for every million American. He said the Christian world has 1,000 technicians per million. The entire Arab world has 50 technicians per million. He says, in the Muslim world, they spend on research and development 0.2%, two out of every thousand of their GDP on research and development. He said, in the Christian world, they spend 5% of their GDP. His conclusion, the Muslim world lacks the capacity to produce knowledge. He said, another way of testing this thing is to talk about the degree of diffusing knowledge. He said, in Pakistan... For every 1,000 citizens, there are 23 newspapers. In Singapore, for every 1,000 citizens, there are 460 newspapers. He said in the UK, for every million people, there are 2,000 book titles. In Egypt, for every million people, there are 17 book titles. 
He said, not only are we failing in our capacity to produce knowledge, we are failing to diffuse knowledge. Then he told his people, let's talk about applying knowledge. He said, the export of high-tech products from Pakistan is 0.9% of its exports. Saudi Arabia, 0.2%. Kuwait, Morocco, Algeria, 0.3%. Singapore, 68% of their export is high-tech materials. He said, let's conclude. The Muslim world is failing to apply knowledge. And then he started to advise his people. He said, please educate yourself and your children. Always promote education. Don't compromise on it. Don't ignore your children's slightest misguidance from education. And please, for God's sake, don't use your personal contacts or sources to promote your children in their education. If they fail, let them and make them learn to pass. Because if they can't do it now, they can't do it ever. He said to his people, we're the world's biggest and strongest nation. All we need is to identify and explore our own selves. Our victory is with our knowledge, our creativity, our literacy, and nothing else. I think he spoke well. The bishop who shared this with us concluded by telling us a story, which I will tell you. He said there was a man in the village who used to sell hats. And one day this man was tired from walking about in the sun, so he decided to rest. So he lay under the shade of a tree, put his hat down, and put one hat over his face and slept. When he woke up, all the hats he put down were gone. Looked for them everywhere, couldn't find them. Then he looked up and saw monkeys in the trees wearing his hats. He threw stones at them and did everything to make them drop their hearts, and the monkeys would not drop their hearts. So he came up with an idea. He raised the heart from his own head. The monkeys raised the heart from their heads. He, he swelled their heart in the air. The monkeys did the same thing. Then he threw down his heart and closed his eyes. When he opened his eyes, all the monkeys had thrown down their hearts, and their eyes were closed. So he gathered his heart and he went. Fast forward several decades, the hat seller's grandson is selling hats too. He's tired one day, he lays under a tree to sleep, covers his face with a hat, wakes up and all his hats are gone. He looks everywhere, can't find them, looks up on the trees and the monkeys have got his hat. Throws stones at them and does everything to make them give his hats back and they will not give the hats back. So he raises his hat in the air and the monkeys raise their hats in the air. He swells his heart around and the monkeys swell their hearts around. He closes his eye and throws his heart on the floor, on the ground. When he opens his eye, the heart that he put on the ground is gone. <laughs> A monkey has taken it and that monkey smacks his face. And that monkey tells him, if your grandfather taught you, my grandfather taught me too. You know, there is another group of people that are painfully close to what Hafiz Muhammad described to his people. They're people of color. And if Hafiz Muhammad taught his people, I am teaching you my people too. Let us pray. I trust that this message has enriched you and challenged you to be all that you can be. If you have any question, comment, or prayer request about what you have heard today, do not hesitate to contact me using the details on your screen, and I will be glad to serve you as best as I can. Also, if you happen to be in or visiting the London, Essex, or Kent area of the United Kingdom, we encourage you to come and worship with us at New Wine Church. All our service details are on your screen right now. Well, till the next time on Maximize Life, God bless you.